morning, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to be speaking mostly around um, some of our work on the two frog monitoring that we've been doing, really mostly with the help of volunteer groups and uh, you know, really harnessing some citizen science to provide data. Um, so why is it important to monitor anything? Why is it important to monitor frogs specifically? Um, amphibians globally are the most threatened vertebrates on the planet. We're seeing declines even in pristine areas. And obviously, um, we're aware of uh, the human influences uh, causing declines. So before things start declining or before things disappear completely, it's important to, to monitor and gauge those trends and also to determine threats. All right, so in 2013, we started the process of developing protocols, monitoring and surveillance protocols for Isambelo, uh, looking at four of the six threatened species in KZN. Um, Pickers Gill's reed frog is a critically endangered species. We've done quite extensive work on that since 2013, testing our various monitoring methods and, and population estimates. Jiba McGuire is going to be speaking after me more in detail on that, so I'm not going to go into too much detail there. The clue frog, as I mentioned, is the one I'm going to focus on today. And then we also have a master's study on the misspelled chirping frog. Um, and I'm going to mention that very briefly um, just now. So just um, the, the monitoring protocols follow the norms and standards set out by Ezen Velo. Um, and you know, it is a fairly long-term process to get these things finalized. We're not quite there yet, but it's also important to test as you go along. Um, part of that is developing these ecological and conceptual models, so that forms part of each species protocol. Um, for the misspelled chirping frog, we're looking at a fairly technical, so don't ask me any complicated questions please, uh, method of using automated recorders called song meters and using um, spatially explicit capture recapture technique. So we're revisiting known sites for the species. James Harvey did some good work for his MSC between 2003 and 2007. During that time, he saw one of these frogs. Um, and so the best way to monitor them is through their calls. Uh, what James did was manual transects, actually walking and estimating um, male abundance. We're sort of ramping that up to today's technology using these song meters, these recorders, uh, and Mia Trina is having a look at this new technique, which basically gives you more of an idea of the spatial array with within the population, how and where are they using the space, and that can also help with abundance estimates. So this is sort of preliminary information. She's got her results from last year. And yes, as I said, James saw one frog in five years. We went out last December and saw one after two nights. So we were very lucky there. All right. So as I said, um, we're really harnessing some of the power of citizen science, and I think you know, for all of us scientists, uh, and especially those of us working in amphibian conservation, you know, this is something that can really be honed to our benefit. Um, there's people out there that are willing to help. I like to think that frogs are going to be the next birds, but we'll have to see. Um, and so citizen science basically is defined as um, a scientific work undertaken by members of the general public, often in collaboration with or under the direction of professional scientists and scientific institutions. And that's, I think, you know, we really need to, as the scientists, develop the protocols so that they do suit our needs and do end up gathering the data that we need, rather than saying, oh, well, this sort of volunteer stuff doesn't work for us because they're not doing it properly. It's up to us to design those, those methods. All right, so globally, there's quite a lot going on, especially in Europe and North America, in terms of amphibian citizen science contributions, um, the Great Crested Newt in UK, there's loads of volunteer groups all over Scotland and everywhere sending in information from all these ponds. Uh, Frog Watch USA is, is quite a big project. Uh, and then here in South Africa, 2004 onwards, we've seen um, the Frog Actus project really taking off um, and lots of contributions coming in from the public to, to that project. Uh, and that continues today and through social media uh, and online submissions through iSpot. You know, these things are just growing really every month, and that's great to see. I mean, last night I got an email from midnight to say, please, can someone try and assess some of these records uh, on the virtual museum? And there's 700 records that no one's identified. 
So, you know, it's great to see an expansion in this area. So on to our subject species, the clue frog. In my opinion, one of our most handsome species. Um, very highly adapted to stream dwelling in, in forest habitats. They're very habitat specific, and as with most things that are threatened, this is a problem, so it occurs only in these canopy forests along the coast. Uh, it's distributed rather patchily in these forest patches um, from KwaZulu-Natal, uh, in Kandla area, uh, in Zulu land. There are a few spots around here, apparently, um, which we haven't verified. Quite a concentration in the outer west Durban area, and then down the coast and uh, into the Transgar uh, Eastern Cape region. So currently we've rolled out the monitoring method for the species at five sites, all using voluntary um, effort to underpin them. The species uh, is a good species to monitor, relatively easy. It lays these wonderfully uh, distinguishable egg clumps, and that's what we use for the monitoring protocol. So as I mentioned, some of these frogs you don't see for five years. The only way to monitor them, monitor them is through calling. So this is a relatively easy one, and also why the citizen science works quite well, because you can go out during the day, kids can do it, um, it's quite an easy technique. So the way we do it is along a set uh, transect along a stream. Uh, the idea is that each month that exact transect is monitored. We collect all kinds of data in addition to just the egg clump counts. Uh, photographs must be taken of each of the egg clumps, which now enables us to actually count the number of eggs within an egg clump. And we measure different variables um, like the attachment surface, so these frogs will lay their eggs above the water, either on uh, plants or rocks or trees, and that's noted, um, as well as other variables like the presence of a female or tadpoles, that kind of thing. All right, so that's just an example. Uh, it's noted down what stage of development the egg clutch is actually at. And that's early, freshly laid, uh, developing within the egg. You can actually see the tadpoles inside there. Um, and then starting to hatch, and that's a nice picture as well, the female guarding her eggs. All right, so Vernon Crooks Nature Reserve down the south coast is where this method has been rolled out the longest, since December 2013, and we just have such a dedicated group of KZN honorary officers there that go out on their Sunday mornings to do this, and they've been doing that every month since December 2013. So that's our, our best data set so far. Um, and the results have been quite interesting. Um, really, those first couple of months, there was huge abundance of eggs, huge number of eggs within the egg clumps, really a productive system. And then what happened? We've had the drought conditions, and we've really seen that through the numbers of, of eggs and, and breeding activity of the species. Um, we've also looked at the water depths that the egg clumps are laid over, and then the, the, the height of the egg clump above the water. So also interesting to see that in that very abundant year, they're actually quite happy to lay in relatively shallow water. And then later on, when in those drought conditions, there wasn't a lot of activity, but when they did lay, they only did so where the water depth was quite a lot deeper. Just a quick analysis only of that site to show the favoured um, uh, or preferred uh, attachment surface, in this case uh, leaves, uh, were the winner, so often Scadoxus and those kind of broad leaf plants that hang over the water, that's what the frogs are using mostly. It may vary between sites, we haven't had enough data or time to analyse the other areas. Um, so this time last year I was very fortunate to go through to um, Kluleka Nature Reserve in the Eastern Cape with Brian Reeve from Eastern Cape Parks basically to roll this method out with ranges from three reserves in the Eastern Cape, so Tuleka, Sulaka, and Rosa Trebe. Um, and yeah, it was just great to see the response from the rangers. They enjoyed getting out there and, and learning about frogs in general and learning about the method. And we've had the data sort of dribbling in for the last year. Again, seeing quite similar trends. Obviously, we can see the, breek, the peak breeding time for the species. It's quite a protracted breeder, so it actually breeds in some places all the way up into uh, 
May, June. Um, like you can see where the peaks are there. Um, and quite a bit of variability between the, the sites as well. Unfortunately, I couldn't overlay rain data with this, but that will be interesting to see. Um, closer to home in Gillets, Crown Eagle Conservancy is just a wonderful example of how some sheer passion and willpower can, and presence of endangered species stopped a road going through this lovely valley uh, and the two frog occurs there and the pink-footed millipede and um, you know, a couple of other threatened species. So um, Cloud and Mervyn and George are twins that basically run this conservancy that's within a housing estate uh, and they've been very willing to have our school groups go along to, to practice this method. And so it's shared between Kloof Senior Primary and Thomas Moore College and they go on alternate months to, to do the monitoring. Uh, which they've now been doing for a year. So again, we're seeing some of those similar trends. Um, we're also overlaying that with the school groups doing mini SAS. So from that, we should start to get a nice indication of water health for that stream. All right. So overall, how does this help? Obviously, we're contributing to those provincial monitoring plans. We're finalizing those now. Uh, and this is really important. We've just had three years of data, but obviously the idea is that this will be for the long term. And we can't really gauge trends uh, if we're not doing it for 10 years or more. Um, but you know, that brings up a problem. We've got these passionate volunteers, but what happens when they retire or move on? And so we need to think about um, sustainability for, for these plans. Um, we're finding out interesting biological information on the species that we may not have known before. And quite importantly, detecting threats early. So, for example, at Vernon Cooks, there's been uh, ginger popping up all over the place. How do we deal with that? Um, the photographs, in some cases, are revealing a fungus on the eggs. Is that problematic? You know, so we need to look at these things and react quite quickly. Um, we get a good idea of breeding success, but ultimately can also use this to work out um, population estimates. Uh, a next step will be looking at the genetics of the species through those forest patches and seeing if that reveals anything uh, cryptic as has been seen with some other species in the, in the same forest patches. Um, and, you know, it's a learning experience. I think both from what I've seen with the rangers themselves and from the school groups, just to be able to get out into the field on a monthly basis is really valuable. Um, and it's time in with the Wessa Eco Schools project, so it's helping us all. All right, so as I say, we're refining the the protocols as we go along, uh, trying new things. Um, we, as I said, we're doing the, the mini SAS, but also maybe looking at some other ways to monitor water quality. Um, we need to improve the consistency. So Vernon Crooks, very consistent, the same people sending in the same data. Um, school groups, obviously, less consistency. So it's trying to you know, work that, that out. Uh, and we'd like to roll this out at other sites going forward. We've got a few sites in mind. Uh, and as I said, who, who to take over when, when some of our volunteers uh, may move on for whatever reason. So that's all from me. And just thanks to all of those groups for, for their contributions.